Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's the Hulu original series, Wu-Tang, an American Saga. Season one, episode nine, entitled, I Declare War. I'll recap the episode and review as I go along. That's all coming up next. <laughs> It's Bunny. <laughs> Opening scene, we see inmates going through this prison hall and all of the inmates that are in the cells, they are shouting out stuff, letting them know, hey, this is their house calling out all kinds of crap to intimidate them as they're getting loaded into the prison cell. After they are getting into their prison cells, we have one particular guy who gets out of his cell and the entire prison hallway gets pitch quiet. It is mouse quiet and nobody says anything as this man walks down the hallway. He's huge. He's so huge that he has to duck his head down to get out of the door and get out of the prison. As he leaves the prison, we see the Sing Sing Correctional Facility sign on the outside and we know where he was was no joke. He starts to get into a car and we show a gentleman come to pick him up and he says, hey man, what's up Attila? So we know that the large guy's name is Patilla, but he doesn't say anything. He's in the car and the man that's driving is like, okay, he's trying to start some friendly conversation and he starts to drive. And as he's talking, he's like, man, you actually got bigger in there. Patilla still doesn't say anything. Guy's driving, looking real intimidated, like, Wow, okay, like I'm just trying to talk to this guy. You just got out of prison and I'm just trying to make small talk. He's still driving and he hears something on the radio and it's Bobby and he hears, oh, we love you, Rakeem. And he's like, oh man, you, you, you know this guy? You know his brother, Divine? Yeah, that's his little brother, Bobby. You know, Prince Rakeem, you know, this is him. It's a pretty cool song. He's jamming to it and Pratilla cuts the radio off. He don't even want to hear that. And he says, well... Ever since Devon got like locked up, you know, everybody in Stapleton, we got to go all the way to Park Hill to get some good stuff, you know. But since then, the game has been messed up. Trying to make small talk still. Batilla's saying nothing, but he is looking beasty. Like he has one thing on his mind, and we don't know what it is. They pull into the project area, and they park. And he does say one thing finally. He turns to the driver. Batilla turns to the driver, and he says, so you got my stuff? The guy bends down and hands him a gun. And as he's holding the gun, Patilla says, the entire time I was locked up, you didn't put not one cent on my commissary. And the guy's looking like, oh, like, is he about to shoot me? And as a viewer, I'm thinking, is he about to shoot this guy? And he goes and he points the gun to him. But instead of shooting him, he pushes his head so hard into the car window, it shatters it and there's blood all on the side of the car. And the guy's slowly getting out like, oh man, this dude's about to shoot me. And as he's getting out of the car, you hear the whispers from the windows and the door, doors of the hood like, hey, that's Patilla, that's Patilla. And he stands in the middle of the project area and pops off some shots like, I'm home. Then see Bobby, he goes into Monica's office. Monica, one of the leads for Tommy Boy Records. And as he's speaking with her, you can tell he's coming to her as a businessman. He sits down, she sits down, and she welcomes him. And that lets you know that he handles things very calmly and he wants to talk about the decision that's been made by Tommy Boy. And he says, the single didn't do well. Because I honestly feel that you guys didn't listen to me and you guys made marketing changes, not only to the song, but the direction of the video. And Monica says, yeah, we made the best decision that we could and it's unfortunate that it didn't sell well, but we have numbers that prove that when we take control of the situation and we do things according to what everybody else is doing, then records do well. It's just unfortunate that your single did not do well. And Bobby even makes the proposition in saying, you didn't believe in me that time. Let me go in 
as myself. Let me go forward and make songs the way I know that I can make them. And Monica says, you know, it's too late for that, unfortunately, because Tommy Boy, we're even sinking in sands as we know it because we have bigger, bigger corporations that want to engulf, engulf us and take over as well. So it's really nothing we can do. And if we do move forward, we wouldn't be able to go along with having a solo artist. We're more looking into groups because there's one check that could be split several different ways. And Bobby says, I, that's great. I have an idea that's kind of bubbling up and I know some people and we could even get Gary. And she says, even Gary's on a totally different label and that wouldn't work either. I'm sorry it didn't work. Let me walk you out. And Bobby just seems completely defeated and he throws his hands up like, okay. And she proceeds to walk him out of the office. And as he's walking out, before he walks out of the office, he shows her the tape that says Wu-Tang. And she's like, Wu-Tang? <laughs> you know, so he did mention to her that he had a group idea and he has people in mind um, before he leaves. And when he leaves, we see an assistant come into her office and he loads all of these tapes and all of that potential from her desk into a box and even the Wu-Tang tape. And that just lets you know, wow, all of those different groups or all of those different things were put on the shelf. So except for Wu-Tang, we don't know what was to become of those tapes that were in that box. Dennis is watching Wu-Tang movies with his brother and his little brother says to him, wow, you know, that's really messed up. He was messing with his best friend's girlfriend. I see why you like this movie so much. And he just, he does the cutest laugh as a little brother, you know, making fun of his, his big brother and egg and stuff on. And he's like, whatever, just look at the movie. And as they're looking at the movie, he's explaining the different scenes and who is who. And he's like, look, that's the Shaolin and then that's the Wu-Tang. They always going back and forth and they're beefing, beefing against one another. And if they just learn to get along, then maybe it can work out. But they're always going back and forth and they're not realizing that they're at war with each other when they should be working together. Bobby is now speaking with Andre standing next to him as he watches Gary take his promotional shots for his album. And he's telling Andre, okay, so what's the next move? You know, it didn't work out with Tommy Boy, but what do you think is next? And Andre, he seems very dismissive. As Bobby's talking to him, he's not even looking him in the eye. He's really having side conversation with him and saying, well, you know, that didn't work. And he's, his answers are very short and quaint. And he's not talking to him like before when it was like, yeah, Bobby, we're going to do this. And this is next. And don't worry. This is the beginning. So he's not talking to Bobby as if he's trash now because it didn't work out with Tommy Boy Records. And he says, well, it didn't work, so you need to go ahead and have it in your mind that you're not gonna make it as an artist. And Bobby takes a pause and says, well, okay, if I'm not gonna make it as an artist, how about I make it as a producer? You've heard my work, you know, I got tons of beats, and Andre says with the most disrespect, you mean those dusty ass beats with Bruce Lee sounds over them? And Bobby is like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, like, wow. And he tells him, Andre says, I have other clients that I have to look after now. And it didn't work out. So Bobby says, so that's it? You're not going to guide me or maybe where I can go and maybe some potential? And he says, look, you know, you know, I always love you, Rakeem. You know, mentioning the song as not as if, he, you know, he hadn't been beaten down enough already. And he gives him that final kidney punch in saying that, oh, you know, I always love you, Rakeem. And he winks at him like, you know, that's over. And he leaves him for dust. And Bobby says, okay. So you don't want to represent me anymore. I can't be a producer. I can't be an artist. Can you at least give me whatever I made, how much money I have? And he says, with commission, promotion, the touring and all of that, you owe me some money. But since we're cool like that, I'll weigh those fees. And he walks off. 
and it's just very disrespectful and just so dismissive but that's the evil industry for you but we see that Bobby is still calm he's getting beat down but the look that he has in the midst of everything talking with Monica talking with Andre he's taking mental notes not only how everyone is behaving towards him but business notes as well the record labels management touring he's taking all of that in and he's making notes in his mind then see patilla he goes to this spot acts like he's about to cop some weed or something like that they go to the trap house or they go to wherever they are to to, to get the deal done and he proceeds to rob the guy selling the goods and then goes into where the supply is and we just hear pop, pop, pop. And he just taking people out. You like, he just got out and he committed at least three or four murders that we know of to, you know, he doesn't care. So the writing is letting us know this is a man that just got out of prison and he doesn't care if he goes back. He comes out and he's counting money that he just took and he got his gun and he got a bag with stuff in it. So he's just gotten some supply and he continues to walk off and hear some more people come out that I guess he didn't get the first time and they try to fight him and he pops them upside the head and probably crack their skull too. So we know that this patilla dude is nothing to mess with cut to Dennis who's still selling weed on Wall Street and as he's selling his weed he hears the gentleman behind him that's spitting knowledge and trying to get to him and, and get to get him to listen but he's ignoring it because he's just trying to sell weed and he could care less he sees Divine walk into the World Trade Center where he's beginning his shift and he's trying to get his attention and we don't know if Divine is ignoring him or he just can't hear him because of the distance and he's just so frustrated with his entire situation and he continues to ignore the gentleman behind him as he goes to sell a bag to this white guy the white guy's like hey dude lover how you doing and he's observing the white guy with the rolex and the ray-bans and the nice suit and before he can give him the weed dennis pulls out a gun it's just like man you know that's a nice watch that's a gold watch so Rolex, you know, give give me that watch. And he's like, but he love you know, we're bros, we're friends. He's like, just give, give it to me. <laughs> and give me the glasses too. So he robs him and the white guy's standing there like, dang, I thought we was cool. And he walks off. So clearly, Dennis has, has he's had enough of the weed and the kibbles and bits money that he's getting because he's starting to slowly snap into I don't give a F mode and doing whatever he can to get what he wants. He's shy at his place and he's watching the video on the box and he's looking at Bobby's video and he's looking at it and he's bobbing his head. And as soon as he sees himself, he's like, oh, ah, that's me. <laughs> I ain't even gonna lie. I probably feel the same way like, oh, that's me in the video. And he sees himself and he's pumped up. He's standing up like, yeah. And as he stands up, we got power that's at the front door. He comes in and he looking at the video. He was like, you still, you watching this? And he's like, yeah, you know, that I was in the video. And it's, you know, and power says, well, why, why did they pick this version? The older version with the other mix was way better. And Shia's like, oh, so you heard of it, huh? He's like, whatever, man, we need to go to the spot. We, these, we then see power and shy they go into cressy's house and when they go to cressy's house it's a lot of people there it looks like they're having a party but cressy says no nah, i got some artists here and i also got some people and money making money and putting it into the music industry and also the movie industry is giving me a lot of cash so and you know don't don't pay any mind to everybody else around us and power says are you sure because we're here to talk business and you got all these people around and Cressy's like, you worried about the wrong thing. Don't worry about that. So as he's doing that, Cressy says, well, you know, Shy, you know, you, you rap a little bit, right? You know, you used to do stuff. And he says, yeah, you know, I used to work with Bobby on some stuff. You know, oh, we love you, Raheem. You know, he's like, yeah, I, I know him. Well, why don't you, you know, spit a little something now? And Power says, well, we don't have time for that. You know what we came for, so why are we dealing with that? And Cressy gives him that look like, don't forget who you work for. And Power says, you know, no disrespect, but you know why we're here, and now you want to talk about rap. And he's like, I even made a studio. I got a studio here, and I'm trying to make money and develop artists. So, you know, do what you do. 
And Shy goes over to a huddle or a group where people have been freestyle on the either spitting their bars. And Shy goes over there and he starts to, to rap. And Cressy says, man, Power, I didn't know we had an artist on our hands this entire time. And Power looks upset and jealous at the same time. Like, okay, we were here to do this and now you're paying attention to Shy because he can rap. But after he does that, Cressy is so impressed, he invites him to the studio, maybe to record a little something, something. Bobby, he's walking down the street with his thoughts, just thinking. And he sees Russell and he's like, gah, gah, gah. like, hey, cousin, you know, what's up? And they start to walking and talking. And as they're talking about everything and how stuff evolved, there's two kids that said, hey, you know, it's Prince, it's Prince Rock here, you know, what's up? Can I, can I have your autograph? And he said, when you sign it, sign on my hat right here. And Bobby signs on his hat. And Russell tells him, you might want to put that in a safety deposit box because that signature is going to be worth something one day. <laughs> but he writes a signature on there. And the kids are like, man, you know, that's really nice. How much money you get for that? And Russell's like, he got like a hundred something thousand in dollar advance, you know. And Bobby's like, nah, I didn't get all of that. I got... 60k you know so we don't know if he's saying that just because he's he in the hood and he don't want to make it look like he doesn't have any money or if he really did get 60k we don't know so the kids say oh you know that's great and that's a lot of money and as they walking off the kids are talking to each other and they say man bobby got 60k that's a lot of money and that's that's crazy man and they walk off and as they walking off we got patilla that's on the on the on the phone on the pay phone, and he overhears it, and we see in his face that, hmm, that's my next Rob uh, situation. Let me get on that. And as a viewer, you're like, oh, crap. Divine is at work, still at the World Trade Center, and he speaks with the manager, and he tells him, hey, by the time I get through doing everything, cleaning up and doing my rounds, that only takes me about two hours. So after those two hours, can I just split? And the black guy tells him, look, these rich, rich white folks, they think that it takes you eight to 10 hours to do everything. So I need you to take 10 hours. And there's a radio in the closet. So he's telling Divine that you got an opportunity to get some extra money. And they're thinking that this job that you're doing just takes so much time and that it's just so difficult. So stretch that out <laughs> and take advantage of making some extra money. And I don't know if you noticed, but that manager, every time Divine sees him, he's in a nice suit. He's in a very nice suit, and he's always on his way, it seems like, to do something bigger than just that job at the World Trade Center that he has. So pay attention to that, because the writers are letting you see this is clearly not just a manager at the World Trade Center. This is a businessman. And he's trying to tell Divine without giving away too much of what he's doing there and letting him know, hey, trust me on this. I got you. Just get you some extra money. There's a radio in the closet. Chill out. Stretch what you doing out, brother. Okay? <laughs> Bobby is at home. He's already packed up his recording equipment, all the tapes, all his music. He's packing away his first love in boxes and he's trying to forget about it and he starts to lay on the bed and he's just not thinking about his music and he hears the dark dog bark and it's at night and the dog usually doesn't bark like that and he's telling the dog you know be quiet you know what are you doing the, the dog dog still proceeds to bark and when he goes to the front of the house to see what he's barking about he looks at the front door and we then start to hear banging. And it's Patilla with a gun banging his way in, trying to get into the house. And Bobby is like, oh, so he takes the dog and goes somewhere. We don't know where he goes, but gladly he's able to leave. And Patilla just goes in and just bangs that door open. He's just going through that house like a mad person looking for this so-called money that he thinks Bobby has. And he can't find any money. But he lifts up Bobby's bed thinking there's going to be something, something underneath there. But instead of finding money, he finds tapes and tapes of music. And he knows that's pretty much gold right there. 
Then cut to the rest of the family in Ohio. Everybody seems to be fine. The mother's been doing some gardening. Cherie's going to school. Randy seems like he's super happy because he has his dad there. Linda and him, they're, you know, passing kisses back and forth. So everything seems to be okie-dokie where they are. And they're having a nice grill time, you know, in the backyard and making steak and potatoes and all types of stuff. And everybody's at the table except except for Cherie. She hasn't come in from school yet. And when she comes in, she goes to the backyard and she sits down with the rest of the family. And the mom says, you know, well, where you been? She's like, school? She was like, well, school ends at this time. So where have you been in between? And she tells them that I auditioned for a school play. And everybody's like, okay, oh, that's good. So she then says, hey, you know, eat this steak. Here, take a bite. She's like, well, I'm really not hungry. And she's like, well, you know, just eat a little bit. And as Cherie is starting to grab something to eat, she's like, oh, excuse me. And she excuses herself and she goes to the restroom and she starts to vomit. And she's like, why am I getting sick and starting to vomit all of a sudden? So you already know she got to be pregnant. <laughs> and she drops down to the floor in the restroom as if she already knows what this can be. We then see Bobby and Devine, they're sneaking back into the house. Bobby got a crowbar and Devine got a hammer. So I guess they figured, hey, if Attila is still here, we're going to at least put up a fight <laughs> before he leaves. And gladly when they get there, he's nowhere to be found. But the house is a mess. Everything is broken. Things are missing. And the house is just messed up. So Bobby goes straight into his room to see if he's taking anything out of there. And he's telling Divine, oh, all my music is gone. My equipment, my, my tapes, just everything. And Divine is just like, well, why don't you just make some more music, man? Look at the house. The house is messed up. And Bobby was just like, that was my music. You know, it's, I can make more music, but all of my best stuff was taken. And Divine is just like, you know, I'm sorry, man, but it's music you can make some more music. Guy is still at the studio over at Cressy's and he's listening to some beats and he's about to go into the booth. He even has a little napkin with some lyrics on there that he's put down and everybody's in the studio waiting on Shy to spit a little something something. And Shy keeps seeing this same woman that he saw at the party. It was really not a party, but he saw at the gathering earlier that he liked that was really pretty. She had a really nice curly fro and she's looking at Shy like she's interested. So he sees her again again in the studio and when he sees her in the studio she's like well hi and he's like what's your name and she's like oh my name doesn't matter you don't care what my name is so you know what do you do with Cressy how do you know Cressy and I'm thinking girl you're asking all these questions <laughs> you had a dope house like asking questions is not a good thing you might want to <laughs> but she asked him that and he says you know, I'm a rapper. I, I, I like to rap. And, you know, I'm just here because I'm, you know, record something. She goes, oh, okay. Well, you a rapper. All right. Shy's about to do his thing, but Power comes in there and he says, I know y'all are getting ready to do this, but I really need to speak with Shy. Cressy's just like, all right, go ahead. You know, he can take a little break anyway before he goes into the booth. So Power's just like, I know you was about to do that. You're not serious about rapping, are you? Like, because we got stuff that we have to do. We got to re-up. We got to do all this stuff. And he's like, yeah, you, you're right, man. You know, I was about to go in there, but I know we got to take care of business. So they walk into the car, and they're sitting down. And and as, right when they sit down, they see a lot of cop cars starting to just come out of nowhere. And they're starting to raid Cressy's house. And Power's just like, man, we got in the car just in time pretty much. And maybe we need to pull off. But before they can pull off, they're observing everything at the house and what's going on. Looking at all the cop cars. Looking at everybody put getting getting put in handcuffs. And they're sitting there watching. And as a viewer, I'm just like, you just going to sit right there in the car. I would have went down the block or something. Because people that's coming out of the house, if they if they see what's going on, shoot, they might see you in the car and be like, oh, that's the snitch. I would have went down the street. But anyway, I know it's just, a, it's just TV. But anyway, so they're looking at them get arrested. And when they come out, we see some detectives and we see some cops. And the cop, one of the cops that we see that, that comes out is the pretty 
black woman with the nice big fro, the curly fro, and she's just like, yeah, you know, she's high-fiving her other cops and co-workers, like, you know, we got them. And Shy's just disappointed because, wow, like, I really had some interest for her. I've been keeping my eye on her all night and that whole time. She was a cop. And they can't help but to sit there and think, you know, wow. But if you really think about it, dropping Bobby's name saved him because that made C Cressy interested in, well, you know him, so I heard you and him do music. And then also music saved his life again when he said he was a rapper and that he was in the booth and then he stepped out. So it really saved him in that situation. Uh, because if he was saying anything that was related to the dope game, she would have made a mental note in her head as a cop of who to get. But gladly, he was able to be out of that situation and out of the raid. Vine is at work and he's cleaning up all of these nice offices and he's looking on people's desk and picking up trash and throwing it away. And he looks at his watch and he realizes, like, I got some time to spare. What can I do? And as he's cleaning up, he sees a deficit finance book that is on the book of one of the desks. The same desk to where he saw a white man at his desk talking over the phone, talking about, oh, you know, 25, you know, that's bad, but it's okay. We did something. And the fact that he made $25 million, you know, just floored divine. So since this book is in the same office to where he overheard this guy talking about making $25 million, he sits down in the chair and he starts to look through the book and he even kicks his feet up because he has plenty of time and he has time to waste, but he really wants to read his book. One thing that's so interesting is that, you know, you hear people say, I'm a hustler, I do this, I do that. But your brain is designed like nobody else. And it was great that the writing was able to allow us to see that Divine has always had that mindset. He's always had that mindset of being a businessman. So the fact that we were able to see him pick up that book and he had true interest in what that book has to proceed and read for him. He sat down and took that time of not sitting in the closet and listening to the radio, but I'm going to sit down and read this book. Bobby gets a threat over the phone. If you want your music back, you need to come up with that money. And Bobby's just like, I don't have that money. You know, I, I, it's, not in my, it's not in my presence. I don't have it. And as he's trying to explain that he really doesn't have all that money, they hang up. After they hang up, we see a shot of Dennis and his brothers. They're still looking at the Wu-Tang movie. And the mother comes in and says, y'all still looking at that? And Dennis just is like, yeah, you know, we're still looking at it. It's interesting. And she says, you know, that movie is about uniting and working together, but you won't even talk to your friends. So clearly you're not learning from that movie. And Dennis just, you know, shakes his head like, you know, wow, she, she kind of right. But she says, you got to do something with your life. You can't just look at this movie over and over again and sit on the couch. So they're looking at the movie. And as they're watching the movie, this scene was so creative and beautiful. Dennis is looking at the movie. And we see the translation of what's really going on in this movie. So we see that we have the Shaolin tribe and the Wu-Tang clan. The people at power have them fighting against one another. They have certain Wu-Tang skills and Shaolin skills that they don't want to share and they don't want to work together. They're just, they've been at war for hundreds of years, being blind to the fact that the people in power, the man in power wants to see them destroy each other. And he even says, why don't y'all hurry up and kill each other so I can be the only one left that, that knows all of these skills that y'all do? <laughs> but there was so much artistry and symbolism in that because if you translate that, it's the understanding of the white man, the evil in America, the projects, drugs, violence, things to make, our, make us hate ourselves. And within our own community, not knowing that the key factor is unity. 
And unity is something that was taken away when we were brought to this place. And that can be in a totally, di a totally different video. But we're seeing the translation in hip hop translation, right? They're in the Nikes, you know, they got the forces on. They going back and forth and fighting. And then they had this epiphany. We need to join forces and defeat this guy. Because if we get rid of him, he's no longer a threat. And they proceed to fight this guy and they're using each other's fighting methods. Oh, wow, that's the Wu-Tang sword. Oh, wow, that's the Shaolin blocking sword. Like, they started to have this epiphany, like, we need to get together and we need to link up. And Dennis, finally the light bulb goes off. And he grabs the tape cover and he tells his brother, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I gotta cut this movie off, I'll be right back. And he gets the tape, puts it back into the cover, and we know that he's on his way to Bobby's house because that's who he took the tape from in the first place. In this episode, while Bobby is packing up his music and he's already made it up in his mind, that was an opportunity, it didn't work, let's move on. He's packing it up and he's trying to forget about it. He runs across a book of the Supreme 120 Lessons. And what makes him look at it again is the fact that Gary has given it to him this time. Because if you notice in previous episodes, from one all the way up until now, he's always had that book. So we can guess that one day while he was in that park playing chess with the older gentleman, that he just never paid it in any mind. He probably was just being nice, Bobby. They gave him the book and he didn't pay it any mind. Only this time he wants to consider open, opening the book because Gary gave it to him. Now, what's interesting, interesting about this book, if you haven't read it, it's a quick read, that not only with people, but specifically black people, when we were brought to the foreign land of what we know as today as America, was that our psyche, our traditions, our ways of thinking was broken down and stripped from us. Having thoughts of hope and dreams and development, smarts, uh, creativity was stripped. What was in the process of making us believe that we came from nothing, that we were nothing. When you get into the psyche of a person, it not only affects you, but your children, your children's children, and etc. So it's this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of breaking down the psyche of persons stolen from the motherland. So this book is to help redirect one's thinking your thought process and knowing that you are a superior being on this planet and you have control of your entire destiny. That's why you always hear you're your own worst enemy because it's true. Many of the times we self-sabotage, right? So this book is to help you reverse and re-implement your true power of thinking. And Gary writes to his cousin on that first page, where it basically describes, and I'll paraphrase, that 10% of us don't know anything and we're okay with that. And there's a certain percentage that knows. And unfortunately with that percentage of those who have the knowledge, they're not any better because they don't share this information and they don't help those that don't know. But then you also have a percentage that are eager and just waiting to learn. And Gary writes that we must awaken that 85%. And that's a lot of percentage of not only people that don't know, but people that wanna know. So if we develop and grow together, then we can all be superior beings on this planet together. And that sparks Bobby's mind like no other. Bobby hears knocking in this last scene. He's thinking, oh, am I about to be robbed again? But he goes to the front door and it's Dennis. And Bobby's just like, 
hey, you know, but what are you doing here? And he has, he shows in the movie, like, you know, I want to return this. And Bobby knows that this is a token of we need to talk. So they go into the kitchen and they sit down and Dennis has two 40 ounces and he has a glass and he says, this is the Charlene and this is the, <laughs> and this is Wu-Tang. And Bobby Tate picks it up. He was like, that tastes terrible, man. What is that? <laughs> and he's like, okay, it tastes terrible, but I'm, tr but I'm trying to, you know, prove a point. You're the Abbott, man. And Bobby's just like, what are you, what are you talking about? He's like, in the Wu-Tang movie. The Abbott always has the right answers. And this whole time, you've been trying to tell me stuff, and it's just going in one ear and out the, out of, out the other. We've been beefing with people. It's been beef, but you've always been the Abbott, man. You've always been the one that said, forget all that stuff, and let's just make this music. Let's just do what we know what we can do. But I wasn't hearing you. I wasn't trying to, to, to even open my mind towards that. And Bobby is just like, yeah. And he, he opens up his mind like, you think that, you know. <laughs> and he's really listening to him. And it's just good to see Dennis and Bobby together and at least talking. And at least trying to sort out any anger or any things from the past that may have prohibited them from working. Bobby has always had that passion. And Dennis always has setbacks because he's let his emotion lead the true destinies and things that he can do because his brothers always ask him, why don't you work with Bobby anymore? Why don't you do music? And Dennis always has had his circumstances as an excuse, but yet Bobby will work literally from sun up to sundown to sun up again on music, 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 music. So Bobby's just like, man, you know, that's great and everything, but my music, my equipment, everything is stolen. And, you know, Attila got it. And Dennis says, so why are we still talking about it? Like, in other words, let's go get your stuff. <laughs> and it's the end of the episode. This episode, I Declare War, I think meant more than I Declare War physically. I Declare War mentally, and I Declare War with myself. Because everybody throughout this episode has been warring, not only with each other and other people, but themselves. Knowing that they have this gift, all these gifts, all of the stuff that's been dismissing them and passing them death uh, uh, has just been missing them by thin hairs, right? And it's something telling you, man, this is the destiny. This is what you are meant for. Open your eyes. So this episode was very well written. It was an eye-opening opener to a lot of characters was an eye opener to Sha and Dennis finally um with Cherie she seemed like wow everything was going right I'm thinking about school I even auditioned for this play and it's possible I'm pregnant so of course we'll see the dynamic soon of her being pregnant and Letting the cat out of the bag who she's pregnant by. And it's the timing of finally Dennis and Bobby talking again. <laughs> so they are writing this so very well. We only have, you guys, one more episode. And the way that this has been written, it will be the perfect crescendo for season two. Uh, and I'm excited about that. I'm glad they didn't rush anything. I'm glad that they took their time to tell the story. I'm glad that they allowed us to learn the government names before just going straight into Wu-Tang because it's going to make people who are new to Wu-Tang appreciate the journey and the music much, much more. Let me know what you think. I can't wait to read your comments about what you thought about this episode. The more I watch this series, it encourages me with certain aspects of my life. And I hope that it's the same with you. And I think the writers and knowing Bobby, now I don't know Bobby in real life, but knowing his character and how he is, you can tell that he's trying to send a message to people who are watching this. It's not just the story.
It's not just a story. Because if it was just a story, he would have left out all of those messages throughout the, this series and letting us see as the viewers, how does this apply to my life? You can't help but to think that. It's not how I view it or anybody else. They're constantly restating that over and over and over again. If you didn't catch that, then you just been, I don't know what you've been doing, just looking at the screen, looking at the colors. I don't know. <laughs> but it is a well-written series and well-actor portrayal series. They have seasoned actors and actresses in this series and I'm glad that they did that because if it was just some actors and the acting was terrible this series would have been a crash and burn and a lot of people would have been disappointed so cheers and kudos to the casting directors the writer the main writers and the assistant writers and everybody that had a sit down at that table deciding how the fluidity of this series would go let me know what you think comment please comment don't be shy i read all the comments and i respond whether we agree or disagree but i can agree to disagree with you right subscribe hit that notification bell so you don't miss any posts and follow me on instagram at that same profile name official bun underscore e and i subscribe to whomever subscribes to me now i did have somebody send me a message and they said hey bunny i'll follow you but you don't follow me back that is because you have it on a setting to where you can't see who's following you or that you follow. You have to give YouTube um, the access in order for you to see who's following you. So you probably have that setting off. But if I see that you follow me, I'll follow you back. I'll see you guys next week. Make sure to check out other reviews. Talk to you later.